Joining me today in the Capital TV show, Dr. Uh, Dr. Paul Sullivan. He is a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council Global Energy Center. Dr. Paul, good evening. Well, uh, good morning from here. Good mm -hmm. evening to wherever and good afternoon in some parts of the world. Thank you. Uh, yeah, in our, uh, for our uh, audience, uh, maybe in UAE, and this is good afternoon. Anyway, uh, doctor, you said, uh, please, please, this is my original statement. Please do not miss uh, misquote me, the original. Uh, so the U.S. pulls out the anti-missile system from Saudi Arabia, and Saudi Arabia makes a defense deal with Russia. D.C. needs to learn how to play bagaman and chess again. What was misunderstood in your quote, uh, Dr. Sullivan? Well, some people quoted it that the United States should learn how to play chess from Riyadh. That mm -hmm. is not what I said. But I definitely agree that taking the missiles out at this time when the Houthis and others are a direct threat to Saudi Arabia mm. was not the most diplomatic or strategic thing to do. I really can't figure out who benefits from this. Yeah, Saudi Arabia doesn't, the United States doesn't. Uh, at the end, the, the, the visit of the Secretary of Defense, Lloyd Austin, was canceled. Uh, it was a Saudi Arabia decision, and why? Well, there are certain tensions. I'm not exactly sure, and nor am I privy to everything that happened within the Saudi bureaucracy or the U.S. bureaucracy. Uh, Mr. or rather Secretary Austin is a, a very busy man. It could have been a mutual decision. I don't know who made the decision. I'm not really sure about that. And, and that level of decision making, mm -hmm. what is publicly stated, is often not exactly what happened. How do you read, Dr. Paul, the tension between the two countries? Well, we've had tensions in our past before, uh, many times. We had our first uh, developing relations in 1940 when our first ambassador uh, was lodged in Riyadh. Uh, and then we had Franklin Delano Roosevelt meeting with the King on the USS Quincy mm -hmm. on February 14 of all days, 1945, which strengthened our relations. And over the years, we've had good years, good hours, good days and bad days. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll get over this. Uh, most of the tensions are due to things that happened well before this time. There are still a lot of tensions in the US with regard to what happened on 9-11. Mm. And there's always in the minds of many Americans. Uh, and again, remember that there is a certain degree of bias uh, on both sides toward the other. Mm. Uh, but bias towards Saudi Arabia is not uncommon in the United States. And I think uh, the embassy of Saudi Arabia and Saudi Arabia as a country could do a lot to try to assuage mm -hmm. that bias. There, there are a lot of good things that Saudi Arabia has done for and with the United States for anti-terrorism, for economic issues, mm -hmm. for oil trade, for mm -hmm. finance, for investment. And there's still more that we could do together. So we have to get over these difficult times, mm -hmm. but the air needs to be cleared on certain issues. You asked a question, if anyone still thinks Iran wants a deal, uh, it is time to wake up. Uh, did you have the answer? No, hardly anyone answered that question, which is not surprising because a lot of the people that uh, are following me or read what I uh, have been written are in official positions and they're not going to answer that. Uh, but also a lot of people are wondering what the Iranians are up to. Uh, why do they threaten to attack the United States along with Hezbollah in response to the killing of General Soleimani, and yet at the same time they want to continue the negotiations with the United States on the nuclear deal? Why do they continue developing highly enriched uranium? And it's clear to the IEA that they're also doing other things uh, that are beyond the official remit that Iran has to work on nuclear issues. Why are they doing that at the same time they want to continue negotiating? Mm -hmm. uh, it's almost like trying to buy a car and being told by the car dealer, the price is going up another $10,000. Are you still interested? Yeah, you know, there has to be a time when we'll simply walk away. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry. 
Yeah, got it. Uh, about Lebanon fuel shipments from Iran, you said the, so the shortage we remain this PR stand aside. It is far from enough fuel and it is only a short run answer. Bigger change are needed internally in investment, politics and logistics. Can you give us more detail here? Oh, well, that's really complicated because Lebanon is one of the most complicated countries. It's a small country, but it really is uh, Byzantine in many ways, trying to figure out who decides what and what goes to whom, and uh, Hezbollah and Iran are running this, and the government with uh, Prime Minister Mataki is saying, we never approved this. This is very bizarre. Now, if you look back into the history of Lebanon and its use of oil, uh, before the real collapse started, you were looking at 138,000 barrels a day, sometimes 150, or it's just, it's a lot more than, one ship that came in recently had 239,000 barrels of oil. Mm -hmm. If you're going to be burning through 15 uh, or 150,000 or 138,000 in a day, you're going to get through that pretty quickly. But also a lot of the oil that's coming in uh, is for electricity production. And that's going to be burning that oil a lot faster. Mm -hmm. uh, but the main point I was trying to get across there, excuse me, is not that this isn't sufficient. It certainly is not sufficient. Hezbollah is making all kinds of uh, PR statements and videos and so forth as the gasoline and diesel trucks are rolling down the streets of their parts of Lebanon and saying, we've solved the energy crisis. Of course they have. Mm -hmm. These trucks are not enough. They're a tiny, uh, a small drop in the bucket compared to what Lebanon needs. Mm -hmm. And, and they're, they're disturbing the energy markets of Lebanon where the country should be doing this. The leadership could be doing this. Excuse me for recommending as an outsider. Mm -hmm. They need to invest in alternative energies. They need to invest in a way to get away from oil and the reliance on outside oil. This is a long run solution. Yeah. Also, yeah. my country can do more by organizing similar fuel shipments to Lebanon and not get a, a PR loss from Hezbollah and Iran as they're going through the streets, firing off RPGs, by the way, right near an oil tanker. Mm -hmm. I gasped when I saw that one. But they're getting more power in the country. Mm -hmm. They're part of the problem in Lebanon. They're not the solution. They the are solution the problem. Is, mm -hmm. The solution is more investment in alternative energies, more investment in energy supply chains mm -hmm. and trying to get demand control and more efficient use. Yeah. Many of the refineries and others in, in Lebanon are just environmental disasters that are terribly inefficient. Yeah, you I, 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 yeah. Sorry. Uh, okay, I will go. Uh, I will stay in Lebanon and ask uh, about one of your tweets. You said Lebanon using cash cards to reduce the effects of ending subsidies makes little sense in a high inflation environment. Can this is very uh, unique uh, word? Can you explain more? Ah, uh, okay. These are cash supplements given to the poor and the lower middle class for when the prices of fuel go up. Everything else is going up. So they get cash in their pockets. What are they going to spend it on? Things that are getting more expensive all the time. The inflation rate in Lebanon right now, I was reading this morning from a good source, is higher than in Venezuela. And it could be higher soon than Zimbabwe during its worst times. This is hyperinflation. We're not sure where it's going. But put yourself in the shoes of the Lebanese family, the mom, the dad, and the kids. They have to get diesel or gasoline for the car. They have to get food, they have to get clothing, they have to pay for school duties, they have to pay for the, uh, the rent or mortgage, and everything's getting more expensive every day. For the very poor, some cash might help, but if they're gonna do it this way, they should have some kind of cash uh, account that has an inflation target inside of it, mm -hmm. which protects them. The problem with this, however, is that 85% or 80%, nobody really knows, of all Lebanese are poor. Mm -hmm. So you really have to subsidize 80 to 85% of the entire country. If this situation is not resolved, if the fuel situation is not resolved, winter is coming, 
people need heat. Mm. They need fuel for their cars. They need fuel for cooking. But everything's getting more expensive. I can imagine what it's like for, let's say, uh, an AUB professor now not being able to eat chicken. Oh my now God. Now they're eating vegetables. Mm. This happened in other countries in the region. Mm. When inflation gets so bad that the middle class and the professional people are eating uh, maybe one meat a week or two a week, you can ask people in the country. I'm pretty sure that's happening with some people. Yeah, yeah. And then the winter kicks in and the kids are cold. And the family's getting colds. Now, remember, we're in COVID. Violence will hit the streets. Mm. You can push people so far. And it's amazing that the violence in Lebanon has been as low as it has been. Mm. Mm. I, I think it may be because of the older people, the, the granddads and the parents, and maybe people my age who were in Lebanon right after the war and knew about the war and some of them went through the war, they realized they don't want to go through that again. But there's going to be a point when the economic tragedy of Lebanon will turn into a civil tragedy of violent proportions. Which is very possible. Uh, Dr. Sullivan, UAE Energy Minister uh, Suhail al mazrouei stresses the importance of encouraging uh, projects such as dolphin gas, which links Qatar, UAE, and Oman, and expresses his hope in the presence of similar investments linking the rest of the countries in the region. How do you explain that or your approach? I think it's a brilliant idea. Uh, minister Sohail is a brilliant minister. He's one of the best ministers of energy on the planet. And uh, that's no real exaggeration. Mm -hmm. I've had discussions with him. I was always impressed at his knowledge and his creativity and, and, and the creative mind he has to look into solutions. Uh, but the solution he's considering is a solution that the region has been considering for a long time. The more linkages there are for electricity, let's say the GCC grid and connecting it with Iraq and even connecting through to Lebanon and to Egypt and to Jordan, this way there could be power pooling. There could be pooling for investments in new generating stations. For natural gas pipelines, a country that has excess natural gas can sell that to mm -hmm. other countries in the region that have a deficit. This makes perfect economic sense and it could be a way to develop better relations across these countries. There are still tensions with Qatar and many in the GCC. Let's not kid ourselves. Mm. Uh, this has been an on and off uh, situation with lots of tensions and, and uh, lots of, let's say, documents that were signed and then neglected soon afterward. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the connections with energy, water and food across the GCC in the entire Middle East and North Africa are vital for the region to survive what's coming. And what's coming is extreme climate change. I know a lot of people in the Middle East think it's not happening. Well, the older people who may think it's not happening, think about when you were a kid, were things as hot as now? Were there such water stress issues? Look at what's happening in some of the areas of the Bekka Valley in Lebanon. You have desertification happening in Egypt. Uh, the, U, the Saudi Green Initiative is a way to turn this around. Mm -hmm. The Saudi government understands this is happening. The UAE government understands this is happening. The Qatari government understands this happening. The Bahraini, the Kuwaitis. The governments at the highest levels understand this is happening and they know they have to react to it mm -hmm. pretty soon. Mm -hmm. The problem is bringing the people along. Yeah. Uh, Dr. S Sullivan, thank you a lot. Uh, that's all for today. Thank you for being with us. And we hope that we give our viewers some answers to things and ne people need to know. So I thank you again. Well, thank you. And I hope I was helpful and I uh, wish the people of the region better lives, most particularly those in Lebanon that we discussed today, but there are many others suffering. Mm -hmm. And that suffering can be reduced by working along the energy, water, food, climate, economy nexus and having leaders think that way. Mm -hmm. Thank and you. Yeah, so one, that's important. Thank you, Maria. Thank you for your thoughts. Thanks. Yep. Bye.